Okay, just very, very quickly, I just want to do a quick revise. And this is mainly for Trinity's benefit because she didn't do art in year nine and Marie as well. Essentially, what you're about to have a look at is the kinds of art which we would term as academic art. Now, although Duchamp is best known for the work that he did in Dada, he was very much uh, an active artist in the late 19th century as well as the 20th century. And this was the kind of art, academic art, that was still very popular and considered to be the style that most artists who were going to be um, successful were going to work in. And this is a classic example of something from the, um, from the 1700s or the 18th century by uh, Jacques Louis David. And you see the classic example of neoclassicism where we have a central figure in the middle balanced by groups of three on either side and framed by the three, um, uh, what do you call those things, arches in the background. The uh, rendering of form is realistic, it's almost photographic. The, the, uh, the subject matter is a, a story from mythology. These images usually were of very important people, again, heightened realism, people of significance, historical events, or um, particular places of importance. And this is uh, within, again, the classical references. This was what was considered acceptable right up to uh, even, even now. You'll ask your parents and this is what they would call good art. Um, realistically speaking though, it hasn't been the focus of art for quite some time. We know that modernism really started in about the 1860s and essentially the most um, significant artwork that sort of kick starts it all is Manet's Déjeuner Soulève. And Déjeuner Soulève starts off with really pushing the boundaries about what was considered art. And when you see those sorts of works just like you've just viewed, and then you think of Déjeuner Soulève, you can really see how his artwork really would have upset the establishment. There was no obvious narrative. The application of paint did not conform to the constraints of the time. Um, even the people in it were obviously contemporary people for his time, not people from mythology. And there were so many things about Dejanet Suleb that really upset um, the establishment. <coughs> now, we, um, this, this painting, Dejanet Suleb, was very, very much a reflection of what was being encouraged by artists, poets and writers by the poet Baudelaire, which was this idea to actually make art about the time in which they were living. And so we know that um, the modernists were <coughs> making artwork about modern society, about the impact of industrialisation. We know that they were looking at um, everyday, ordinary leisure time as significant and substantial subjects for making art about. Previous, that was not on the cards whatsoever. Into this, Duchamp is a very young man. He comes along and he starts to paint with his brothers. He comes from a very um, affluent family. They're all artists in one way, shape or form. He becomes the most best known. But there are other examples of his brother's work that you will stumble across if you go looking for Duchamp. Marcel just happens to be the most famous. Marcel Duchamp is a very important individual who's born into a time in history where there's a lot of change happening. So <clears throat> you're about to watch several different videos <coughs> looking at, firstly, the impact of World War I on the world in which they live. <coughs> I'm going to keep coughing constantly by the looks of it. And also, hopefully you'll also start to understand the kinds of upheaval that were happening in Europe during this period of time. You'll see on the video about World War I and its impacts that the Prussian or Austrian-Hungarian um, uh, country ceases to exist and gets carved up into three new countries, being Czechoslovakia, Austria and Hungary. It used to be one nation. 
and it used to have its own king and queen. That ceases to happen. We also know at the beginning of the 20th century, the Russian um, royal family is executed and communism comes in. So we also know what happens with the lead up to the First World War. We know with the futurists, they were excited about the First World War. They thought, yay, mechanised war, that's going to be brilliant. The Dadas went, mm -mm, a really bad idea, and they react to that. <coughs> so the video you're about to watch, first and foremost, is dealing with this idea about what were the consequences of World War I right up into World War II. It moves along really quickly. It's only being shown to you as a reminder so that you've got the context of what was going on in the world at the time. So when I start to talk to you about Marcel in more detail, then we're going to have... After four years of fighting in World War I, millions had lost their lives and the world was forever changed. Hi, I'm Rebecca Braden and welcome to WatchMojo.com and today we'll be taking a look at the aftermath of the First World War. Undeniably, the greatest consequence of the First World War was the massive loss of life. France had lost nearly 1.4 million soldiers and an additional 300,000 civilians in the war. More than 1.8 million Russian soldiers were killed, as well as 1.5 million civilians. In total, World War I was responsible for the deaths of over 16 million people. However, numbers relating to the death toll are still debated. Considered separate but still related to World War I was the effect the flu pandemic of 1918 had on the world. First seen in North America, it is suspected the flu was brought to Europe by the American forces. This flu was ultimately responsible for the deaths of nearly 50 million people worldwide. Many countries on both sides felt the severe economic consequences of waging a world war. The United Kingdom went from one of the world's largest overseas investors to one of its biggest debtors. Less concrete changes for Britain were also apparent. There was a surge in national pride among some of the Commonwealth nations. Countries like Canada, Australia, and New Zealand held important roles in numerous battles throughout the war. Subsequently, they received more diplomatic autonomy in the decade that followed. Returning home from the battlefields, soldiers across the world were greeted with a shifting social landscape. Women had filled the gap in jobs left by the men serving in the war. Motivated to help their country, many women worked distributing coal or making ammunition and also provided a large amount of voluntary work. These new roles helped to change the social status and working lives of women even after World War I had ended. Political lines were redrawn in the aftermath of the war. Once powerful German, Russian, Ottoman, <laughs> and Austro-Hungarian empires were dissolved, with the latter two ceasing to exist altogether. Large parts of the former empires were now split up into new countries like Finland, Turkey, and Czechoslovakia. Most importantly for the future of Europe and the world was what was happening in Germany. A parliamentary system called the Weimar Republic replaced the imperial form of government in 1919. However, the new government was riddled with issues. They were forced to deal with hyperinflation, hostility from other countries, and political extremists within their own country. Many in Germany were still resentful over the Treaty of Versailles, which had forced the country to accept sole responsibility in causing the First World War. Adolf Hitler and his Nazi party used these strong emotions to their advantage, and Hitler climbed to the position of Chancellor of Germany in 1933. Very quickly, Hitler established a totalitarian regime called the Third Reich and put an end to the Weimar Republic after only 14 years. Only 20 years after the end of World War I, Nazi Germany invaded Poland and the century's second world war was underway. Okay, so what we see there is um, fairly clear this. ideas about the context of which the world that they were living in. And Duchamp was um, one of many artists that lived in that kind of you know, very tumultuous time. Picasso's Guernica was also a result of what they'd seen happen prior in World War I and the lead up to World War II. And all of that was happening with Guernica. It was stuck in the middle. There was a, in, this, in between World War I and World War II, Spain has a civil war. So the poor Spanish never seemed to get out from underneath war for a very long time. Now, this next piece of um, video is on looking at Marcel Duchamp in particular with his work, A Nude Descending a Staircase. Many people think about Duchamp as a Dada artist only, but that's not the case. He was involved in Cubism, Futurism, Dada, and even Surrealism. 
And this particular artwork, A New Descending the Staircase, is probably the most um, outrageous artwork that he put together that upset his audience more than even Fountain did because it, was ex uh, it basically was exposed to a lot more people. A lot more people got to see it and a lot of people had no idea what this artwork was about. Again, you have to reflect on what was the conservative understanding of what art was at that time. When you see this artwork, for you, you'll think, oh yeah, I, I can see that, I understand that, it's not offensive to me at all. But when you think about the constraints and the conservative nature of what um, the established art academy had placed on its audience's expectations, when they saw Duchamp's artwork, A New Descending a Staircase, you'll understand why the audience reacted in the way that it did. This episode of Two Minute Masterpiece is brought to you by On Air Video, producer of fine human form reveal, now available on DVD, download, and streaming. At the turn of the last century, there was a movement to break down the barriers protecting traditions of art. Among those leading the siege was French artist Marcel Duchamp, who created some of the most controversial art of the time. For instance, this piece entitled Fountain is a simple men's room urinal signed and dated. These were referred to as ready-mades, the idea being that just the act of putting something on display automatically makes it a work of art. But perhaps his most controversial work was Nude Descending a Staircase. It's an abstract representation of a figure walking down a flight of stairs. But it's painted in a manner as if it were capturing the figure in time-lapse motion. Traditionally, painting or sculpture depicting movement, no matter how realistic or energetic, were essentially moments frozen in time. The painting is oil on canvas and measures 57 by 35 inches, and was completed in 1912. Duchamp acknowledged the influence of the stop-action photography of Edward Moybridge and the stroboscopic work of Etienne Jules Marais, but rendered it all in a cubist effect. When the work was introduced at the 1913 Armory Show in New York, Americans didn't quite know what to make of the painting. Many found it unintelligible. Mostly, it was derided, as in this cartoon, The Rude Descending a Staircase, subtitled Rush Hour at the Subway. It was also referred to as Explosion in a Shingle Factory. All in all, the work was considered just another European modern art hoax perpetrated on the American public. Not that any of this deterred the artist. On the contrary, he was delighted with the notoriety and was so encouraged that he moved to New York two years later. If he wanted to shake up the art world, he certainly accomplished it. I'm Larry Withers, and this is your two minute masterpiece. Okay, so let's move on to the next, your next part. Okay, this is um, two gentlemen from Khan Academy, and they're talking about this particular work called An Advance of a Broken Arm by nice. Duchamp. Um, unfortunately, it uh, goes for a little bit longer than I would like, but nonetheless, they actually do formulate some very interesting conversations. So hang in there and listen to it. And then we're going to talk about why Marcel Duchamp is so important to contemporary art. Because the point of me actually teaching you about Duchamp is because he is the platform or he is the foundation for all those struggles that you have with contemporary art. Okay? So just hang on to that thought as you listen to this. Yeah. And how do you spell it? That's D A B A. It was really a nonsense word, and that's why it was called that. And the idea was to create a kind of anti art, to kind of challenge what art was. You know, the world was in flames, the war was raging across Europe, and artists didn't want to have any part of it. They wanted to show how absurd and how dangerous the world had gotten. And one of the artists who was a Dada artist, whose name was Marcel Duchamp, he began to create what we call ready-made, or what he called ready-made. 
Some of them were assisted ready mates, where he would take two objects that existed in the world and put them together. And some objects were just pure ready mates. And one of my favorite is called In Advance of a Broken Arm. In Advance of a Broken Arm. And we're looking at it on the left here. Uh, and you had to explicitly tell me that it was on the left. <laughs> yes, I did. So just, so just to make this clear, this is In Advance of a Broken Arm. That's exactly right. And, and you had to point that out because we have a very similar piece on the right-hand side right over here, which I just got off of Amazon, which is a, a snow shovel. And really, they're not much different at all, are they? No, they both seem like snow shovels. They are both snow shovels, except that Duchamp has taken his snow shovel out of the garage or out of the hardware store. Yes. Um, and relocated it, sort of reframed it, and said, no, this is a ready-made. This is something to look at and to understand within an aesthetic sphere. I'm thinking what I think many people are thinking. Okay, he did that, and I mean, it seems like what he did was a very cynical act, which was like, here's art for you, all you jokers. I'm gonna go buy a snow shovel and stick it in a museum. And I, I don't know, I feel like he's like laughing at people. I think that there is definitely cynicism here. And I think that this is very much related to the objectives of Dada, which was to undermine the way in which we valued art, the way in which we understood art saying that the world had become a kind of place of chaos, mm -hmm. a kind of dangerous chaos. And the artist wanted to, in some ways, have nothing to do with that any longer. So how can I most undermine, in a sense, destroy the way in which we had defined art, to create a kind of anti-art? I think that's exactly right. And was, was he like the first person? Because, you know, actually, you know we, we just talked about Warhol. And I said, oh, you know, now someone took a, like a piece of advertising, stuck it in the museum, would feel very driven. But Warhol did that a while after Duchamp. So to some degree, it feels like now Warhol is derivative. Because Duchamp went full, you know, Warhol actually had to do some work. He actually, like, actually painted a soup can. But this guy, he, he's, I mean, he's way ahead of his time. He, he literally just bought a snow shovel and showed up. Duchamp would say, however, that finding a perfect ready mate wasn't an easy thing. He went on a hunt. And that most objects did not suit his definition of what a, a perfect ready mate would be. You know, he is creating a kind of narrative here. I mean, what do you think of when you when you put that snow shovel together with the title? It it, it to me it looks like a um, a parody. It, I mean, you know, in advance of a broken arm. Yeah, it, it, he went and bought a snow shovel and 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 he called it in advance of a broken arm, which is a very kind of fancy sounding title, which you know makes you think a little bit. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I. I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I think you're absolutely right. I think it's sort of impossible. And here's the even more absurd part. We're looking at a photograph, not of the original in advance of a broken arm, but actually a, a later snow shovel that he replaced the original with after the first had been lost perhaps to a snowstorm. Yeah. Oh yeah, we read, we read August 1964, fourth version after lost original in November 1915. So it, I guess, well, can you even have an original? Can you, can, well, exactly, because there's probably a hundred of those originals. So let's play this out for a moment. Imagine that this came up to auction, and it went to Sotheby's, it went yes. to Christie's, it went to one of the big auction houses, yeah. and it's a Duchamp, it's a, this important example yes. of Dada. And so the auction is going to start at some very high numbers, yes. right? You know, it's going to start at $2 million. Yeah. But then somebody... But is that really what this might go for? Uh, these are priceless objects. <laughs> Except that yeah. somebody could walk in to yeah. the Home Depot or go onto Amazon, yeah. as, as we just Or said. their grandfather's barn or something. That's right. You know, imagine they could get past the guards of Christie's and walk into the showroom with their own snow shovel, and there would be no difference physically between the snow shovel that's up on the podium, that's for sale, that's for auction, and that's reaching these astronomical figures, versus the snow shovel that's worth, you know, $29.99. So that's a fascinating question because. Exactly, they're exact, physically identical snow shovels, and one was touched by Duchamp and placed in a museum, and another thousand were not. And because of that, this one is this one could go for millions. So you start off by saying, is Duchamp being cynical? And I think in some ways he really is. He's trying to make, in a sense, the apparatus of the art market transparent. He's trying to force us to grapple with 
how we define what art is and how it's important, and maybe that our values are really misplaced in some way. But he's also pointing to something else, which is that art is not necessarily in the 20th century located in the practice of its making, located in the proficiency of the artist and their brushwork, but it's located in the sort of symbolic language that art can evoke, in the way that art can transform the way that we see the world. So, I, I'm actually becoming a bit of a fan of Duchamp. But I, I, I think there's, I, 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 and I'm also thinking of becoming an avant-garde artist. <laughs> so what is, you know, in the same, like I want to do, I want to do an art installation called Breath of Air, which is <laughs> I will go to that location, that little part of volume, and I'll just exhale right there. And, and we'll just put like a little placard that someone had exhaled at this point. And it was, that would push thinking in art, where the art object does not even exist. You know what? It's been dispersed through the museum. You, you, you've missed your moment because art was made like that in the 70s. Oh, and I days. missed that. Someone you missed it already. That. Someone's literally created art that does not exist. Or art that exists as a kind of performative act. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this, this one's a difficult one. I'm, um, I mean, yeah. <laughs> this is about as tough as it gets. Yeah, I mean, well, what's your what's your take on it? I'll, I'll push. I mean, in advance of a broken arm, do you, does what do you make? I, I mean, I I agree with you with everything you said that like he has introduced this, he's challenging people's notions of art, challenging the art market, challenging all of these. But it's done in my mind, it seems like in a very cynical way that I'm going to put a very mundane object on there and make people like bid on it and think of it as art. I mean, what what do you what do you think of this name, advance of a broken arm? And, that it's you know this all this special showcase and the fact that it costs the same as a you know a, a, a five dollar social you can get home depot. You know when we think about poetry, for for example, we, we we don't worry about the cost of the typeface. We we think about where that poetry brings us emotionally and intellectually. It transforms us. It changes us. And so it's interesting that in the visual arts we are still so tied to the handicraft. Duchamp is really distancing art. From the handicraft and making it a purely conceptual process. And so he's really sort of forcing that issue in, I think, an important way that has really challenged the 20th century and made contemporary art possible. So, I got, so I, that's interesting. So, what you're saying is, is that he's really like, like poetry, poetry is sort of the idea of the poetry. Someone can copy and paste that poem, we can all share that poetry. There's no physical words there. And, and he kind of did the same this idea. And that's why he was able to take another shovel and do it again and again and again. But it's still, I mean, we say that, but at the same time, the art market does not necessarily view it that way. They view this shovel as being somehow holy versus the other shovel that was made on the same assembly line is not, nowhere near as holy. I think that's exactly right. And in some ways, Duchamp failed. In some ways, I think the avarice of the art market has prevailed despite his attempt to undermine it. You know, we still would auction this at a very high price, and we would still differentiate the two shovels, and we would still value one over the other in the sense we heroicize the object that is somehow connected to the conceptual, even though I think Duchamp, in some ways, was really focused on, you know, separating those things. And what about, I mean, just going back to the name, I mean, I, I, I can kind of buy some of this in, in that he's really challenging what is art and it's the idea of putting focus on something like this. But at the same time, it seems like his the title is a little bit uppity. As for, I mean, why didn't he just call it Snow Shovel? Like, why can't something just call it Snow Shovel? Or why didn't he just call it Blank? I mean, why did he have to say in advance of a broken arm? I'm, I'm not going to pretend to know exactly what his motivations were, but I think that the cynicism that he spoke of before is exactly his point here. He's almost creating a narrative, and some of my students have said they could imagine that somebody slipped on the ice and broke their arm, and that there really is this. <laughs> oh, I could imagine. Ice. You know, I could. We could call this piece in advance of a cherry pie. Yeah, I mean, you know, I can imagine that after working a long day shoveling snow, I will go eat a cherry pie. Uh, yeah, I mean, right, and there's something to name this piece of art. And the, I think that notion of absurdity was yeah. really central to to Duchamp's practice and what what he was interested in. And I think he wanted us to sort of bump up against the absurdity of that title and to be challenged by it. Fascinating. All righty, I don't want you to watch the next one. Um, the next thing I want to show you is, I need to go back to slide number one, is the thing about Duchamp that you've just sat and listened. Can you sit up for me now? You've just listened to all this information about Duchamp. 
and that he has made these artworks that are quite provocative. Uh, hence, he is a, the great provocateur, one who provokes, one who agitates, one who upsets. Um, how or why do you think I would go to the trouble of teaching you Duchamp in context of what we look at with contemporary art? What's the connection? They question what art is. Uh, contemporary artists do? Yes, they do. So they picked that up from Duchamp. What else have they picked up from Duchamp? The, yeah, exactly. The, the focus is on conceptual thinking, not something else. Okay, the materials are secondary. The beauty of the object is secondary. The focus is on the experience, the intellectual experience. Um, here's a question for you. Who's ever been to an art gallery or an exhibition and looked at an artwork and went, what am I supposed to do with that? You've had the experience that Duchamp wanted you to have. In the past, before Duchamp started this, and it has become more refined and sophisticated by contemporary artists, audiences went to galleries and looked at artworks that they already knew the backstory to. Because these artworks were either about a mythological story, which they would have read, Maybe it's a biblical story or some narrative that they've read in a popular book. Maybe it's a, an interpretation of a piece of well-known poetry. Um, is it a historical event? Is it a well-known person? Or is it a place that they may have visited? They knew the backstory. So there was nothing about that artwork that was going to upset them because they intellectually already had the information. So when they looked at the artwork, all they were needing to do was to respond to the technical skill of the artist, the choices that the artist had made in terms of what part of the story that they had chosen to present. That's why Dejeuner Soule was such uh, an upsetting work for the audience because there was no backstory. Who is this girl? What is she doing with the men? Why does she have nothing on and those two men do? They're not even taking any notice of her. What's, what's going on here? Is it a landscape? Is it a picnic? Is it about figures? What is this artwork? Oh, there's a still life in the front. Does it help to make sense? Mm -hmm. So when we look at contemporary art, which is the focus of why I'm teaching you about Duchamp, is that contemporary art has become far more sophisticated but relies on the foundational theories that Duchamp puts in place. Now Duchamp's best known for shifting the focus away from technical skill to this idea about critical thinking. So when you've gone into a gallery, or I took you to the DNR and you were on Cockatoo Island or wherever it happens to be that you've had this experience, and you've looked at the artwork and you've thought, what do I do with that? I don't understand it. I don't know what I'm supposed to think about this. What did you do next? You read the citation list and what happened then? you started to try and interpret what the work was about. Now we know with contemporary art, the whole point of it is to force you to think. It's like when you read a novel, a work of fiction. The point of that is to take you to new places, to give you new ways of thinking, to give you new ideas about how you might perceive the world. And as you read that story and get caught up in that story, the author is taking you on a journey where you start to consider things differently to how you would have before you encountered that book. Visual artworks do the same thing. Maybe not so clearly as a book does, but it does the same thing. It takes you on a journey as you try and interpret, is there a narrative or not? Um, you're looking more at the ideas within the work rather than the choice of materials or how beautiful those materials may look. Think about the artworks that you had to write about in regards to the Caldor collection. They weren't particularly beautiful at all, but more importantly, it was about the thinking that they created as a result of looking at that work and going, what do I do with this? What are they trying to say? It's not about it being pretty or technical. 
The other thing that Duchamp was doing as well that we see happen even more so in contemporary art is that Duchamp listened to what Baudelaire said. Sure, he appropriated it in his own particular way, but he thought about what Baudelaire had said and Baudelaire had said, paint art or make art, make poetry, make writings or write, write books about the world in which you live in. And Duchamp says, hey, we're in the 20th century. It's a world based on mechanisation. We reproduce things left, right and centre. Why are we still so fixated with the, the idea of the you know, untouchable original piece that is made by the genius? He said, that's a load of rubbish. That's not what art is about. You've been duped. It's really about making you think more broadly, more deeply, have a more richer life. Learn to question. Don't swallow everything lock, stock and barrel like you've been taught to. That's how we ended up in the First World War in the first place because a bunch of megalomaniacs, greedy men, decided that they wanted to have this, this and this and they dragged the rest of us into it with them. Art needs to liberate you to think for yourself, to question, to reconsider your position in the world, to reconsider the human condition and who we are. That's the point. So contemporary art really pushes those ideas further and further, looking at now a global world, uh, embracing new technologies. We're now in the 21st century. Mechanisation has gone even further than Duchamp could have ever thought or dreamt. But it's still about what is it doing to your mind? How is it affecting your emotions? How is it opening up your eyes to the world in which you live? And that's why Duchamp is so strategically important and probably is seen as the most important artist of the 20th century, if not all time. He vanishes into almost obscurity for quite a few decades. He gives up making art and goes and plays chess, which I think is quite funny because if you think about the game of chess, it's a game of strategy. His art was also a game of strategy. He actually manipulated and orchestrated the way that people responded. Um, when he actually did first show Fountain, he was on the committee that actually set up that exhibition. The fact that he wrote uh, Mutt on the side of that was as, as much about um, remaining um, uh, insignificant, not insignificant, uh, uh, remaining disconnected from that artwork as an experiment to see how the rest of the audience plus the board would actually react to it. And they freaked out. They didn't know what to do with it. And they didn't know it was his work. And they went, we can't show that. It's, it's offensive. It's this, it's that. So with Duchamp, he, he disappears into uh, obscurity for a couple of decades. He's not lost completely. Um, there are still people who are aware of what he did and the significance of what he did. But it really wasn't valued. Um, then along comes this young American uh, sculptor and, and printmaker and painter and a whole range of other things that he gets involved in called Robert Rauschenberg. And he is taught by one of his lecturers at university about Duchamp. And he gets these great ideas from reading about Duchamp's theories. And what Robert Rauschenberg goes on to do is he goes, okay, it's about thinking. Art making is about the thinking process. It's about not so much how beautiful the actual um, product or end product is in and of itself. It's more about what happens as a result of me actually making this artwork for the audience. And so Rauschenberg's living in a rundown studio, sharing it with Jasper Johns in New York. And he hasn't got money for materials, but he's fascinated by, by what Duchamp did. This idea about new ways of thinking about the world, about materials, about art, challenging the art world. Who are these people who think they're so self-righteous as to make all the rules about what's good art and what's not? And he would actually do this um, routine where he would walk around one block and he would collect stuff that was being thrown out on the sidewalk. You know how we have council throwouts? Well, they would have rubbish put out every day. And 
he would walk around, there'd be lots of apartments, there'd be lots of stuff out on the sidewalk. This is late 1950s. And if he didn't find anything in that first um, trip around that one block, then he'd allow himself one other block. And for whatever he collected in that journey, he would then drag it all back to his studio and then make art. Now, a lot of the art that he made really upset a lot of people as well. But those who were clued in to what Duchamp had initiated back in the earlier part of the 20th century caught on to what he was doing. Warhol is another one that caught on to this idea. And if you look at um, pop art, you can see a lot of overlap. It's been recontextualized and the meaning of pop art work is quite different. But the links between what Duchamp did and what the, post, um, the pop artists did and then later on the po uh, post-modernists did, you can see how important Duchamp's foundational thinking is until we arrive where we are. Is this all making sense so far? Any questions? Okay. So this is um, a, a rehash of a Year 9 presentation. Um, so we won't get to the end of it today. But essentially the information is there so it's really easy to absorb. This idea about his, his intention, always his intention was to engage the audience with the artworks. He didn't care how he did that. And often it was through humour, shock and irony that he achieved that. So if he got you really upset and really angry because of one of his artworks, then he was happy because that at least you were forced to reconsider the parameters of your thinking because it had so outraged you. Um, and then if we think about an, um, another artwork that is an outrageous artwork by Andre Sareas called Piss Christ, it taps very closely into what Duchamp did, this idea of using shock to upset its audience with an intention to actually force them to rethink. Now, we've talked about that artwork in detail in the past. We know, yes, it's an offensive work, but it's also asking us to think in other ways as well as just confronting religion. It's asking us a whole range of different questions. So that kind of artwork, the reason why I brought that up was just to show you how offensive the work that Duchamp created was for his time. This particular artwork here, LHOOQ, which was done in 1919, um, if you get someone who can speak French to actually say those letters, it becomes like an acronym and it actually comes out as she's got a hot bum or actually a little bit grosser than that. But here is an icon of portraiture. For goodness sake, it's a painting that was done by Leonardo da Vinci himself. How dare you deface this work? Duchamp upsets the establishment to take something that is sacrosanct, something that is holy, something that you cannot touch, and he graffitis it. And then he has this provocative, upsetting statement at the bottom, which takes away the whole point of this artwork being about this, you know, you know, um, this woman's face and how it's so difficult to read what it's about, and we start to think about what she's wearing under her dress. It's scandalous. And it was so upsetting, <laughs> he got in a lot of trouble for it. Um, then we've got fountain, which of course is a urinal. For goodness sake, these things are supposed to be kept behind closed door. I don't want to think about, you know, some man standing up peeing into this thing. It's outrageous. How dare you put that on display? It belongs in a hardware store. Blah, 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 blah. All that kind of hoo-ha would have happened. And the other comical thing is the fact that it's lying on its back and it's totally no longer useless, uh, useful becomes a sculptural form. And of course, in advance of a broken arm, which is just uh, you know, a shovel that he's chosen and he's put in an art gallery and claimed it to be an artwork. Now, the other thing that's really interesting about Duchamp's work that was referred to in that Khan Academy video is this idea that why does that one shovel worth millions or why is it priceless and one identical that could be found in your grandfather's shed? Why is it only worth the five bucks that it cost to buy it? And this is where Duchamp failed. Duchamp wanted to take away the power of the, of the object, the precious nature of the object. And so for him, once he'd made his statement, he didn't care if the artwork got lost. 
And these are not the original artworks that Duchamp made. The, um, you would have noticed that the original artwork was made in 1915, but I think it was 1954 that they had the piece that was now in the exhibition space. And they had to specifically um, ask a company to make um, a fountain. They had to go to a porcelain making company to actually get it remade because they didn't exist anymore. So the, none of his work actually, uh, um, his ready-mades that are, that is, um, none of them actually exist as original pieces anymore. But they still have immense value. Why is that? Why is the object so important? Why is the object itself so valuable? When for him, for Duchamp, it was not about the object, it was about the idea. So why do we consider these artworks so precious? It's not a rhetorical question, I want an answer. Yeah, but why is that important? Why would society value the theories behind Duchamp's work so much that they now revere the objects that initiated this thinking? Okay, he set a precedent for art, and what was that precedence? That the conceptual like, thinking behind it is more important than the physical object. Okay, so the conceptual thinking is more important than the object. What's the next part of that story? Because conceptual thinking is so much more important, what's the result for us as the audience now that is different from a, an audience 120 years ago? We have a larger role. We have a larger role. Excellent. Anything else? Yes, he's actually encouraging us to be more critical thinkers. He sees that as incredibly um, valuable. This idea to be able to think for yourself. Why is the ability to think for yourself so important to Duchamp? And why is it so important to mankind? Why do we learn about history? No idea. Why do we learn about in particular things like what happened in the Second World War to the Jewish people? Why do we learn about what Pol Pot did to everyone in Thailand? Thank you. The point of learning history is so that we don't repeat the same mistakes. If you turn off and you don't listen and you don't stay informed, then we're doomed to keep repeating the same mistakes. Duchamp wants you to not only be educated but to be critical thinkers so you don't become little blind freddies that jump through every hoop that you're told to jump through. That's why I find it so interesting when um, you're teaching kids to write about art. They go, oh, just tell me what to write, miss. And I go, no, I'm not telling you what to write. You have to learn to process this yourself. You must learn to think for yourself. Because only through thinking for yourself will you be set free. Otherwise, I'm turning you into a little slave. I'm turning you into a little robot who doesn't have the capacity to think for themselves. And that's doing you a huge disservice. Duchamp was a great believer in getting people educated, because he was, but he saw the power of it. Because if you had enough educated people, they will not follow the folly of very powerful people into another repercussion like the First World War and unfortunately the Second World War as well. For him, keeping you thinking, keeping you broadening your ideas, listening to new ideas, thinking whether you want to keep that or throw that out or how does it fit in with your own particular view of the world. That is what the point of Duchamp was and that's the point of contemporary art today. How are we going? Okay, I'm going to stop talking now because the bell's going to go for in a very short amount of time.